okay? Now, Regulation Z also has this thing called the three-day right of rescission rule. The three-day right of rescission rule applies to, very important you see this, most of these transactions. The three-day right of rescission rule does not apply to owner-occupied first lien residential real estate. So a closing or the conveyance that we have been discussing, when the buyer receives the deed, boop, there is no three-day right of rescission. The conveyance of owner-occupied residential real estate does not have a three-day right of rescission rule. If you've ever refinanced your house, it does have the three-day right. If you've ever financed your house and tried to take out money, you go to the closing and sign all the documents. You do not get the check that day. You actually have to wait three days to do that because they're afraid that if they handed you the check, you'd come back in tomorrow and go, hey, I want to re rescind that, at, but, but, but you got the money. Oh, I already spent it. So they make you wait those three days to make sure you don't change your mind. Then on day four, now you can come in and get your money. It also is very picky, or one of the things they really go towards is this advertising of real estate. So in this advertising, they have these things called a trigger term. A trigger term is something that you mentioned, like purchase price, down payment, the number of payments, the amount of payments, the due date, or the annual APR. You mention any of those three or any of those trigger terms, you actually have to tell them all of them. All of them. And you guys have heard this on those car commercials at the very end where they go, you know, not all people will qualify on 30-year terms on 5% fixed annually at 3,785 payments a month for 30. What do you think they're doing? They are fulfilling that requirement. We all laugh about that guy that talks real fast at the very end about all that stuff because of the Regulation Z, which is consumer credit, not just houses. It could be Chrysler Credit. Chrysler Credit is a consumer creditor. Therefore, they must mention, hey, zero down. That's a down payment. That's a trigger term. Now they've got to mention all of the other terms involved. Now, if they would have said something innocuous like low down payment, that's not a trigger term. Zero is down trigger term. Easy monthly payments, that's not a trigger term. If you said $500 a month payments, that's a trigger term. So you mentioned one. Think of specific versus general. Zero down versus low down payment, all right? If you violate the Regulation Z, you could be subject to penalties. And here we go. Look at this. One, if it's a company, they could be issued punitive damages. Do you guys know what punitive means? You need to know this for future reference. Punitive damage means punishment. You are being paid, you are being punished for making this mistake. Doesn't necessarily mean the client was ever harmed. You're just being punished because you made a mistake. Could be a 500,000 or 1% of the creditor's net worth. Think about now you know why Chrysler does this because they could be penalized 1% of Chrysler's net worth, okay? Equal Credit Opportunity Act. As a person extending credit to you, like the lender or the bank doing it for you or a mortgage loan originator, they are extending credit. And because of that, there are certain things that they cannot use. There are eight protected classes in the ECOA. Now, 
Watch me and listen to what I'm telling you. This is not fair housing. These are different than the Fair Housing Act, so don't get these confused. We haven't covered the Fair Housing Act yet. We will. In the Fair Housing Act, there are seven. In the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, there are eight. Race, color, religion, national origin, sex, marital status, meaning if two guys show up and say, we want to borrow money, you can ask, are you friends or are you friends? Can't ask that. Age. Hey, my dad got a 30-year mortgage when he was 80. It's a little ambitious, don't you think? They can't say, dude, you think if I were you, I wouldn't even buy green bananas. <laughs> All right? So you can't use age. And the receipt of public assistance. All right? Those are the eight protected classes when a creditor is going to extend credit to a consumer. All of those have to be taken into effect, meaning you can't use them as a di differentiating factor. Maybe that's a better way to say it because I don't want to confuse you. You cannot take these into consideration. They have to be innocuous, all right? There's a thing called the CRA, which is the Community Reinvestment Act, which gives some banks a special leg up. They are too small to compete against Chase, or they are too small, so they may get a little bit of help. And to do that, they are expected to loan money inside of their footprint, that one, three, and five mile out. They must actually make loans to people inside of their community so that the money stays in the community, all right? They can't take the inner city people working and take their money in that bank and then make loans to the outlying suburbs because that's sucking the money out of downtown. So a CRA bank would have to make deposits and credit uh, extensions to people within their community so that Bob down the street who uses our bank also uses us for mortgage. And because they do that, they get a little bit of an advantage and they are defined by geographic boundaries or they could be defined by some other things. All right. <clears throat> if the creditor is extending money, there is a thing called RESPA, the Real Estate Settlement Procedure Act. Now, we talked about TILA, Truth in Lending Act. This is a second one that deals with specifically the settlement procedure. And I told you that we call it a closing, but typically most people call it a settlement because that's where we settle up all the monies and the deeds. So there is a special act that governs the closing or the settlement of property if there is new financing involved. We are going to spend another chapter, a huge portion, specifically talking about the RESPA laws that deal with the conveyance of property when there is a loan in place. When those people decide who gets the loan, remember they cannot use those eight protective classes, but there is this thing called AUS, underwrite, Automated Underwriter System. Most mortgage loan originators will call it AUS. It is also called computer um, or desktop underwriting, meaning there is a computer that does it automatically, and it will take into consideration just, you know, what's the credit score? What do they make? Boom, and spit the answer out. Usually very quick, usually a lot cheaper in the application, and all kinds of things get sped up. AUS is great if you have a client that is going to pass with flying colors. Hey, I've got a million in the bank. My credit score is 950000 This should be a no-brainer. That might be somebody you go, hey, we're going to use automated underwriting because they'll be done and answered and their loan will be ready really quick. As opposed to 
it's actually not listed here. There is a thing called, oh yeah, here, the human judgment, as opposed to hand underwritten. Hand underwritten. This is where a person actually goes through it and looks at it and will make a decision. This is actually great for someone that maybe has a little bit of issues. Maybe their credit score is right on the line. Maybe they've got an extenuating circumstance. I personally have a good friend of mine that was involved in a horrific work accident where he broke his back. His employer kept telling everybody they had workers' comp insurance. Well, unbeknownst to my friend, they did not. The, uh, the owner of this small construction company was a jerkwad and lied to their employees so that when my friend broke his back and went to the hospital and had surgery, there was no insurance. So uh, my friend got caught up in a bunch of outstanding medical bills, and there was a lawsuit that ensued. We're not going to get into all that, other than the fact is when you looked at my friend's credit and his DTI, his debt to income was like 110% because of all of these medical bills that were on his credit for not reporting because his employer didn't pay the insurance. If you take his credit report and move away all of the one-time incident bad issue and looked at the rest of his DTI, he was like a 32% and all that. That would be a case where Freddie Mac, who is the largest secondary mortgage buyer, would say, you know what? We agree that this guy is actually a special case that maybe if we did not look at the medical bills, he probably is a good guy. So there are definite cases where you may want that hand underwritten versus the desktop underwritten or the automated services. All right, so we have just spent a bunch of time over the last couple chapters dealing with financing. Like I told you, I kind of get confused or have different feelings on this because while there are people that specifically specialize in this information called mortgage loan originators, very seldom does the consumer actually get to them first. They're going to come to you and they're going to ask you questions that they don't see a separation between looking at a house and getting approved. They're going to assume that's all the same thing. So you who can explain this process of financing to your client actually will gain a client for a good period of time. Most people just, hey, all I know is I talked to this dude. Three days later, he called me back and said, I can get approved for this. I don't really know what's going on. Where you're going to sit down with him and go, hey, look, here, we need to look at your debt to income. Can you reduce some debts? We're going to look at, you know, your credit score. What kind of loan? Do you want a prepayment? Are you going to be living in the house a long time? Is it something you're flipping? So all of this stuff, you are going to appear to be the savior to them. And if you can explain financing, while I agree, it may not be our job, it will be make that consumer go, gee whiz, Raymond was a genius. He helped me. And he's going to start passing your name around. So while it may not, quote unquote, be our gig, you better understand the basics, at least for the exam, all right? But you will need to know the basics so that you can help your client buyer out to start the process of buying property. Once again, feel free to email me, Raymond at realuniversity.com if you've got questions. There are probably questions right down here in this next chapter online, and then you've got questions at the end of your book, all right? I'll see you in the next chapter. See you later.